This video relates to the ongoing discussion between two opponents, Louis Pasteur and Antoine Bichon. These two opponents had developed their own distinctive opinion about the cause of diseases known as the germ theory and the terrain theory. The germ theory, championed by Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, proposes that diseases are primarily caused by specific microorganisms such as bacteria or viruses. According to this theory, these pathogens invade the body from external sources and directly lead to the development of illnesses. Pasteur's groundbreaking work on vaccination and Koch's postulates for identifying disease-causing microorganisms were instrumental in establishing the germ theory as a dominant framework in the field of medicine. On the other hand, the terrain theory advocated by Antoine Béchamp takes a different perspective. This theory suggests that the internal environment of the body, known as the terrain, plays a crucial role in determining the manifestation of diseases. Bichamp emphasized that a weakened or imbalanced terrain could make an individual more susceptible to infections and other health issues. The terrain theory places significance on factors such as nutrition, lifestyle, and overall health as determining factors in the development of diseases. It is worth noting that the terrain theory has connections to the field of epigenetics, which explores how environmental factors can influence gene expression and subsequent health outcomes. By understanding the germ theory and the terrain theory, we can appreciate the contrasting viewpoints surrounding the causes of diseases. In this video, we will showcase the forgotten historical experiment by Dr. Milton J. Rosenau, which validated the terrain theory. Despite this and many other similar studies, mainstream medicine continues to rely on the germ theory, which has never been conclusively proven. Experiments to determine mode of spread of influenza. The study written by Milton J. Rosenau, Doctor of Medicine, Boston. The experiments here described were performed on an island in Boston Harbor, on volunteers obtained from the Navy. The work was conducted by a group of officers detailed for that purpose, from the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Public Health Service, consisting of Dr. G. W. McCoy, Director of the Hygienic Library, Dr. Joseph Goldberger, Dr. Leake, and Dr. Lake, all on the part of the U.S. Public Health Service, and cooperating with those medical officers was a group also detailed for this purpose on the part of the U.S. Navy, consisting of Dr. J.J. Keegan, Dr. Dwayne Ritchie, and myself. The work itself was conducted at Gallops Island, which is the quarantine station of the Port of Boston, and peculiarly well fitted for operations of this kind, serving adequately for the purposes of isolation, observations, and maintenance of the large group of volunteers and personnel necessary to take care of them. The volunteers were all of the most susceptible age, mostly between 18 and 25, only a few of them around 30 years old, and all were in good physical condition. None of these volunteers, 100 all told in number, had influenza, that is, from the most careful histories that we could elicit, they gave no account of a febrile attack of any kind during the winter, except a few who were purposely selected, as having shown a typical attack of influenza, in order to test questions of immunity, and for the purpose of control. Now, we proceeded rather cautiously at first by administering a pure culture of bacillus of influenza, Pfeiffer's bacillus, in a rather moderate amount into the nostrils of a few of these volunteers. These early experiments I will not stop to relate, but I will go at once to what I may call our experiment. Experiments at Gallops Island. As the preliminary trials proved negative, we became bolder, and selecting 19 of our volunteers gave each one of them a very large quantity of a mixture of 13 different strains of the Pfeiffer bacillus, some of them obtained recently from the lungs at necropsy. Others were subcultures of varying age, and each of the 13 had, of course, a different history. Suspensions of these organisms were sprayed with an atomizer into the nose and into the eyes, and back into the throat while the volunteers were breathing in. We used some billions of these organisms, according to our estimated counts, on each one of the volunteers, but none of them took sick. Then we proceeded to transfer the virus obtained from cases of the disease. That is, we collected the material and mucus secretions of the mouth and nose and throat and bronchi from cases of the disease and transferred this to our volunteers. We always obtain this material in the same way. The patient with fever in bed has a large, shallow, tray-like arrangement before him or her, and we washed out one nostril with some sterile salt solution using perhaps 5cc, which is allowed to run into this tray, and that nostril is blown vigorously into the tray. 
This is repeated with the other nostril. The patient then gargles with some of the solution. Next, we obtain some bronchial mucus through coughing, and then we swab the mucus surface of each nares and also the mucus membrane of the throat. We place these swabs with the material in a bottle with glass beads and add all the material obtained in the tray. This is the stuff we transfer to our volunteers. In this particular experiment in which we used 10 volunteers, each of them received a comparatively small quantity of this, about one cc sprayed into each nostril and into the throat while inspiring and on the eye. None of these took sick. Some of the same material was filtered and instilled into other volunteers but produced no results. Now I may mention at this point that the donors were all patients with influenza ITI Boston hospitals, sometimes at the U.S. Naval Hospital at Chelsea, sometimes at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, where we had access to suitable cases. We always kept in mind the fact that we have no criterion of influenza. Therefore, I would like to emphasize the fact that we never took an isolated case of fever but selected our donors from a distinct focus or outbreak of the disease, sometimes an epidemic in a school with 100 cases, from which we would select four or five typical cases in order to prevent mistakes in diagnosis of influenza. Now, thinking that perhaps the failure to reproduce the disease in the experiments that I have described was due to the fact that we obtained the material in the hospitals in Boston and then took it down the bay to Gallup's Island which sometimes required four hours before our volunteers received the material, and believing that the virus was perhaps very frail and could not stand this exposure, we planned another experiment, in which we obtained a large amount of material and by special arrangements, rushed it down to Gallup's Island, so that the interval between taking the material from the donors and giving it to our volunteers was only one hour and 40 minutes, all told. Each one of these volunteers in this experiment, 10 in number, received 6 cc of the mixed stuff that I've described. They received it into each nostril, received it in the throat, and on the eye. And when you think that 6 cc in all was used, you will understand that some of it was swallowed. None of them took sick. Then, thinking perhaps it was not only the time that was causing our failures, but also the salt solution, for it is possible that the salt solution might be inimical to the virus. We planned another experiment to eliminate both the time factor and the salt solution and all other outside influences. In this experiment, we had little cotton swabs on the end of sticks and we transferred the material directly from nose to nose and from throat to throat using a west tube for the throat culture so as to get the material not only from the tonsils but also from the posterior nasopharynx. We used 19 volunteers for this experiment and it was during the time of the outbreak when we had a choice of many donors. A few of the donors were in the first day of the disease, others were in the second or third day of the disease. None of these volunteers who received the material thus directly transferred from cases took sick in any way. When I say none of them took sick in any way, I mean that after receiving the material they were then isolated on Gallup's Island. Their temperature was taken three times a day and carefully examined, of course and under constant medical supervision they were held for one full week before they were released and perhaps used again for some other experiment. All of the volunteers received at least two and some of them three shots, as they expressed it. Our next experiment consisted in injections of blood. We took five donors, five cases of influenza in the febrile stage, some of them again quite early in the disease. We drew 20 cc from the arm vein of each, making a total of 100 cc which was mixed and treated with 1% of sodium citrate. 10 cc of the citrated whole blood were injected into each of the 10 volunteers. None of them took sick in any way. Then we collected a lot of mucus material from the upper respiratory tract and filtered it through Mandler filters. While these filters will hold back the bacteria of ordinary size, they will allow ultramicroscopic organisms to pass. This filtrate was injected into 10 volunteers each one receiving 3.5 cc subcutaneously, and none of these took sick in any way. The next experiment was designed to imitate the natural way in which influenza spreads, at least the way in which we believe influenza spreads, and I have no doubt it does, by human contact. This experiment consisted in bringing 10 of our volunteers from Gallup's Island to the U.S. Naval Hospital at Chelsea into a ward having 30 beds, all filled with influenza. We had previously selected 10 of these patients to be the donors. And now, if you will follow me with one of our volunteers in this ward, and remember that the other nine were at the same time doing the same thing, 
We shall have a picture of just what was happening in this experiment. The volunteer was led up to the bedside of the patient. He was introduced. He sat down alongside the bed of the patient. They shook hands and, by instructions, he got as close as he conveniently could, and they talked for live minutes. At the end of the five minutes, the patient breathed out as hard as he could, while the volunteer, muzzle to muzzle, in accordance with his instructions about two inches between the two, received this expired breath, and at the same time, was breathing in as the patient breathed out. This they repeated five times, and they did it fairly faithfully in almost all of the instances. After they had done this for five times, the patient coughed directly into the face of the volunteer, face to face, five different times. I may say that the volunteers were perfectly splendid about carrying out the technique of these experiments. They did it with a high idealism. They were inspired with the thought that they might help others. They went through the program in a splendid spirit. After our volunteer had had this sort of contact with the patient, talking and chatting and shaking hands with him for five minutes, and receiving his breath five times, and then his cough five times directly in his face, he moved to the next patient whom we had selected and repeated this and so on, until this volunteer had had that sort of contact with 10 different cases of influenza in different stages of the disease, mostly fresh cases, none of them more than three days old. We will remember that each one of the 10 volunteers had that sort of intimate contact with each one of the 10 different influenza patients. They were watched carefully for seven days and none of them took sick in any way. I think we must be very careful not to draw any positive conclusions from negative results of this kind. Many factors must be considered. Our volunteers may not have been susceptible. They may have been immune. They had been exposed as all the rest of the people had been exposed to the disease, although they gave no clinical history of an attack. Dr. McCoy, who with Dr. Ritchie did a similar series of experiments on Goat Island, San Francisco, used volunteers who, so far as known, had not been exposed to the outbreak at all, also had negative results. That is, they were unable to reproduce the disease. Perhaps there are factors, or a factor, in the transmission of influenza that we do not know. As a matter of fact, we entered the outbreak with a notion that we knew the cause of the disease and were quite sure we knew how it was transmitted from person to person. Perhaps, if we have learned anything, it is that we are not quite sure what we know about the disease. Conclusions Within the context of the Rosenau experiment conducted during the Spanish flu pandemic, the results failed to provide the expected outcomes and cast doubt on the infectious nature of influenza. This experimental endeavor raises questions about the validity of the germ theory and invites deeper exploration into the true causes of diseases like influenza and COVID-19. Speculatively speaking, a similar experiment to Rosenau's but concerning COVID-19 could potentially shed light on the transmission dynamics of this so-called infectious disease by intentionally exposing individuals to respiratory droplets from COVID-19 patients and analyzing the outcomes we might challenge the notion that COVID is caused by the spread and replication of a virus, and we could even question that it actually spreading from person to person by personal contact. This hypothetical experiment, if undertaken, could potentially disrupt prevailing preventive measures, such as mask wearing, social distancing, and vaccinations. However, it is crucial to acknowledge the potential ramifications such findings might have on the established vaccine industry making it unlikely that scientific institutions would undertake such a study, let alone find a reputable scientific journal to publish its disruptive conclusions.